I am happy to introduce um, Mike Poole. He is the head of advanced development at Hyperfine and has been with the company since it started in 2014. He obtained his PhD in 2007 from the Sir Peter Mansfield Magnetic Resonance Center at the University of Nottingham and has focused on MR physics and engineering, half in academia and half in industry. And he will be talking to us about um, ensuring a good reproducibility in a closed source um, software. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Let me just uh, share my screen here. To... Are you able to? Oh, there we go. How does that look? Is that okay? It looks great. I'll okay. Take it away. Thank, thank you. you. So, yeah, thank you for the introduction and thank you for um, inviting me to speak here. Um, uh, yeah, this is a great workshop. I'm looking forward to the other talks uh, in, in the other sessions. It, it's uh, really, uh, really good to see. Um, so uh, especially thanks to Laura for inviting me. Uh, she, uh, she really helped me uh, uh, come up with a title and uh, guide me on the, the content that, that you all find most interesting. So I hope I can uh, live up to her and your expectations with this presentation. Um, so um, obviously I work for Hyperfine, so I do have a conflict of interest. Uh, I'm a co-founder, employee and shareholder. Um, most of my presentation is, is, is opinion and, uh, and, and so I, I hope there's not too much conflict. Um, but also a disclaimer that, that I'm not a software engineer. So I, I, there's, there's a license down here for the sharing and uh, um, I, I'm sure you all understand what that means. Um, so um, Hyperfine, for, for those of you who don't have uh, a Twitter account, is a company that um, started in 2014. Um, we started uh, the company um, on a mission to increase access to uh, MRI. Um, it was founded by uh, Dr. Jonathan Rothberg, who has um, a prior history in starting uh, medical device companies, uh, particularly in um, uh, uh, DNA sequencing, um, as well as um, a recent company which does um, makes a medical product that is a, a handheld uh, ultrasound system using MEMS technology. And so he really um, looks at MRI and wanted to kind of make it accessible to the world. Um, and so I kind of joined um, because I kind of believed in that in that mission. Um, what we did was we we. Um, spent a few years creating um, the, uh, the world's first portable MRI. You see it here on the right-hand side. Um, you also see on the right-hand side, um, this is one of our first, uh, this is our first professional photo shoot of our scanner a couple of years ago when we couldn't afford uh, real models. So uh, I volunteered my son and my wife to, um, uh, to jump in the scanner and have photos taken of them in a studio. Um, and if you look at our website, for, for more information about our company and our product, you'll also see some embarrassing photos of me pretending to be a doctor um, to save money on, on models. But um, we have over 45 scanners um, that we've built and uh, deployed in the world. Um, and we have, um, we're continuing to distribute these systems. They're for sale in the US and now Canada. Um, and we also have a lot of research partners ac across the world, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, but for the, uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna start just with open and closed and, and talk a little bit about um, our motivations, uh, both for academics and then give you some context for, for, uh, for small medical device companies like us. Um, so obviously, in general, academics are trying to advance knowledge and the consensus around the, the, the natural world. Um, but as, as Laura and others are, are going to talk about during the, these talks in this workshop, um, the incentivization structure is, is through tenure and funding. And um, obviously, that leads to the well-known problems of publishing or perishing. Um, and, and uh, even a, a good friend of mine has, has written, written articles uh, on um, uh, the, how this bias is towards novelty versus reproducibility. And, and um, Laura mentioned that earlier, and I'm sure there'll be some good presentations on that for the rest of the workshop. 
Um, and open source and open data are, are two very important ways to accelerate um, uh, knowledge discovery. Um, uh, uh, they address this this reproducibility crisis. It gives gives everybody a leg up to to be able to reproduce research. Um, and there are obviously other problems with uh, being able to move away from the bias of novelty, um, particularly paywalls for publications and um, peer review openness, um, and just the general uh, the way that scientific is, research is commoditized and metrics for success. Um, so, so that's all kind of known. I want for for a medical device company. Uh, for I wanted to give you the same motivation, but how that plays out in a medical device company, and particularly one that that makes uh, physical hardware and as well as software, um, like we do. Um, so, our aim as a company is primarily adding patient value, and that. Was kind of kind of a business speak for um, making products that help people um, in diagnosis, particularly for MRI, but um, generally to improve patient outcomes in hospitals all around the world. Um, this is all under the umbrella of patient value. Um, but we have to we have to survive as a company. So sometimes we'll use our families as models, but we'll also we, we need to sell our products. Um, in order to deliver that patient value. So um, we have to be a, a profitable company. Um, and so the, the, I put a couple of examples here. It's either profit or, or perish, or in some ways um, we might think of companies as patenting or perishing. Um, and um, uh, so that essentially leads us to, to at least starting off in a, in a closed source and closed data because in a, in a resource limited environment of a medical company, it is the most efficient way to deliver patient value. Um, not that there are other, aren't other business models for doing that, but for companies like us, it's, it's, it ends up being the most efficient way. Um, but back to... Um, to, to how hyperfine um, works with uh, closed development or open uh, research. Uh, this this is how we operate. So uh, we we find that open source and open data at this stage it does doesn't bring patient value in the short term at, at the scale that we want to have an impact. Um, but we do think that um, developing uh, an open platform, developer toolkits, um, and making our making code open will, in the long term, develop, uh, deliver patient value. So we, it is something that we're we're looking at, and our developers here really hope we can start working with. Um, so what that means is, because we're a closed environment, we we um, we have to make sure that we're doing the right thing for our customers and um, for our, mainly for our patients. So we we do a lot of very rapid iteration. Um, obviously a small company like us can, can do rapid iterations. So we work closely with our customers and figure out kind of what, what they want from, from the product and iterate very rapidly. Um, and just like a, a community that contributes to to, to a particular software project, um, we want to be able to build a community, albeit in the, our place uh, within Hyperfine, but um, design as much of the product, the hardware and the software, as much of that um, ourselves. Um, and the reason for that is that we really like to understand how the, all of the parts of the system interact so that it, so internally it is open and we can all understand how the interactions work. Um, one of the things that um, drives us at Hyperfine, though, is also um, being able to do clinical research, not just add value on, on in the clinical setting and emergency department, but also looking at clinical research as, a, as an untapped kind of MRI uh, uh, field of research. Um, so we, we do think that having our system um, the designing it the way we did, um, we've standardized all our acquisitions in the clinical use cases. Um, and that goes even down to the parameter level. So everything is basically fixed. And that enables us to 
have um, sequences and data that, that are matched over um, all scanners wherever they are in the world. Um, and so we really believe that that can help with the reproducibility of clinical research. Um, but we're, we're hoping to um, that our, the low cost of the device and the fact that it is portable really will allow us to kind of take very large uh, sample sizes uh, for MRI um, and more diverse sample sizes, both of which are um, very big problems with MRI um, doing, uh, being used in clinical studies. Um, we we uh, plan to put, put all our data uh, integrate with a cloud management system. So we're working on that actively at the moment. And then let, um, for, for the purposes of sharing data, leave that, up to, um, leave that up to the researchers and hopefully we'll provide enough incentive for them to openly share data with other collaborators for, for training of AI algorithms, for example. Um, and so we're also actively uh, seeking both uh, close research collaborators on, on the technical side, but also um, clinical partners. Um, so onto the, onto the actual meat of the presentation, really, really what I was hoping to convey to you, that was the, uh, more of an intro. So you might, from the outside looking in, you know, we have um, lots of fantastic developers and we're trying to sell products and we're trying to help patients. So, but why would we care about good science and reproducibility? Um, the, the first main reason is if you, if you make decisions, um, about how to design your product in without good science and without being able to reproduce your results, um, you, you'll design bad products and they're going to fail. And, and you know, for small companies like us, um, it's hard to, it, it's difficult to take um, um, failure on, on a product because we, we're not, uh, we don't have the support mechanism of other parts of a company. Um, and so, Another reason is also the law. Um, we, uh, I think there was some discussion in the previous presentation about um, about regulations, particularly FDA clearances for for three D slicer, for example. Um, and so, any medical device has to uh, has to be approved for sale in the countries that you're trying to sell. Um, but that means that all of the decisions that you make, all of the uh, good science that you do within your company to make decisions is open. It's open to regulators though. It's, um, they can come in and look at all of your documentation, your, your hypotheses forming, your, um, uh, the justifications for decisions um, and, your, and your sample sizes and, and um, doing that right um, so that auditors can can be confident in that your device is safe um, is very important. Um, so um, I wanted to give you a, a little example of how that actually happens. Uh, so I'm going to give you one specific example. Um, I'm going to take advantage of my conflicts of interest declaration here and tell you um, about uh, we just launched uh, a product which is includes deep learning reconstruction. And this is um, actually the first um, FDA cleared product that includes not just a post-processing, but also the, the reconstruction component using um, uh, neural networks. Um, but then how, how do you do good science and how do, you, um, how do you convince yourself and also the FDA that, um, that you're making a good product? Um, and so the approach we take is, is we start with a hypothesis as, as, as we should. Um, and the hypothesis that we want to prove to be true um, is that deep learning reconstruction is at least as safe and effective as linear reconstruction. So we're moving from a device that has linear recon to a DL recon, and it has to be at least as safe and effective. And that's what makes a product um, um, acceptable for, for sale and can add value to patients. Um, in the bottom right, we see an example, um, an anecdotal example that um, of a linear recon and a deep learning recon that um, shows that anecdotally we, um, we should be getting much nicer images, but we have to prove it. We have to prove this hypothesis. And so um, we talk about in um, 
medical devices and as part of the regulations is two things, two Vs, the uh, verification validation. And that's how you provide your objective evidence um, to prove such a hypothesis. That's the, that's the structure you use. Um, so um, we assuming that the, the deep learning recon is a black box, we kind of identified all of the sources of variability that might negatively or positively affect the safety or efficacy of the device when you make uh, when you make deep learning reconstruction your standard. And for each one of these categories, you might um, you might be able to fundamentally justify with objective evidence that um, that the variability can't affect the performance. So you would you would document all of this. You would say this is our network structure. It can't uh, act on the data in this way, and so therefore this variability cannot uh, affect safety and efficacy. Um, the second step. Um, is, is what we call verification. Um, and that's when you abstract a particular performance. So an example in this case might be the ability to see small objects and not have them uh, wiped out, which is obviously gonna be a particular problem for, for MRI if you're looking for small, uh, small bleeds or lesions. And so you could come up with abstract tests to, to verify that it doesn't behave in that way. And, it, and that allow, allow you to give you confidence that with that, in that category of variability, um, that the, the new recon is at least as safe and effective. But that doesn't cover everything. So you have to go to the next level and simulate um, a, a real environment, real clinical environment with um, radiologists and patients and uh, uh, doing these studies can can get very expensive and so you have to really justify your sample size along each dimension of variability and and make sure that in combination with verification you're really you're really analyzing every possible way um that that data variability or software environment variability or clinical environment variability doesn't affect your your output and so the, all of these studies combined, it, it's a it's a lot of work, and it, it gives you great confidence when when you um, when you prove that um, this hypothesis is true to to some degree. And so, really, we believe that um, that process is obviously mirrored um, as good science. And looking at um, sufficient sample sizes is, is is something that is extremely important. And we end up having a submission that was over 4,000 pages long, and it was just this, this change to the product, everything else in the whole MRI device stayed the same. And then they, they, they come back and they ask questions. They look at all of the, the, your scientific results. They look at your um, theory of uh, deep learning uh, and you really document everything. They ask some questions and then we provided more verification and more uh, justifications. And that was another 700 pages. And now you can you can see how this this becomes a, a very expensive process um, uh, to actually get medical devices cleared. Um, but in but in fifteen weeks from submission to to our clearance, we were able to to get that clearance, and then you could put these images, which are significantly better, um, into the product and and start um, starting to add value to patients. Um, the, the other thing that's very important for a company like ours is, is the tools, the culture, and the process within this closed environment. And within the closed environment, we make it as open as possible. So we use many of the same tools um, for large-scale uh, development uh, and integration. We have very, um, we maintain a very open culture of uh, sharing and peer review of each other's work. But it's very important, and, and I think we, we do it quite well. We, we, we try to hire from diverse backgrounds, um, both engineering and science and academia and industry, and lots, as much variability in terms of the people we hire um, um, as, as possible. Um, and putting all that together, I think, um, with uh, teams that trust and respect each other, and it allows you to really um, make progress on these 
on the on the good science and the good decision making for your product. Um, going back to one question about the the clinical side, um, we're really hoping that the standardization and, and the low cost of MRI um, really really will help um, do clinical studies. Um, and one example of that that we that we're starting to to work with um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So this is a project um, headed by um, Steve Williams and many other collaborators, where uh, we're going to deploy um, I think it's twenty five of our scanners, some to uh, research sites such as King's, um, but also uh, majority of them to low and middle income countries to to study. Um, whether such a, a device, a, a portable MRI device, could help in, in the, 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 the care and eventually the, the workflow and treatment of, of very young children in, in uh, low and middle income countries. So this is um, a very exciting um, project that we're working on. And I think um, the way that we've designed our, our product in mind to help these kind of clinical studies, I think will really, really benefit this project. Um, so I wanted to end just a little bit on um, some of the open and closed source projects that we that have helped us at Hyperfine. Um, you know, the, I think it's important to recognize all of the work that people put into all kinds of different projects, whether they're open source or, or closed source or even the tools. Um, and so we, you know, we're, our code is based on um, essentially Python and Linux, um, and we use all, all kinds of different uh, open source and uh, closed source tools um, as we're developing our device. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that um, gives maybe a, a, a look inside from the inside of a closed development uh, environment, um, give you some context about how we work and how we strive to kind of do the right thing uh, in terms of the science and decision making for um, for uh, for our patients. Um, so, uh, if you have any questions, just either pop them in the chat. Hopefully, I I can answer them. But also, feel free to reach out by my email. Um, so, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. I really enjoyed that, especially um, in parallel with the three D slicer talk.